Hi, my name is Terry Lee Bavona, and today is the 12th of July, uh, 2011, and this is the second video in a series I'm doing uh, called A Life Worth Living, uh, The Wakeful Dying of Hospice Nurse Terry Lee Bavona. Um, about five weeks ago, I was diagnosed, uh, surprisingly, uh, with very advanced stage four bone and prostate cancer, uh, and advanced enough that I actually have about uh, three to six months uh, prognosis in this body I'm in, and uh, I'm actually a hospice patient after having been a hospice nurse for the past 12 years. So one of the things that I wanted to give back to life is uh, some of these amazing experiences that I had with patients along the way and uh, the things that my experiences with them taught me uh, about life. So today's story is called The Invisible Wall, and uh, uh, it'll be self-evident what this uh, wall is and why it's important for us to realize that uh, we uh, sometimes as family members and sometimes as healthcare professionals uh, create this illusion of this wall uh, to make ourselves feel better um, but nobody really wins when we do that so here's the story is uh, there was a fellow one time I'll call him Bill and Bill was about a 60 year old fellow with uh, advanced cancer and uh, in a rural area of a town uh, far enough out in the country that along his uh, property line was a uh, gravel quarry and trucks used to cruise through there 70 80 mile an hour uh, big heavy trucks um, that was kind of the landmark for how to get to his house um, he had three daughters one was actually a, a cancer nurse with a, a oncology group uh, so the three daughters were at the house um, myself I arrived with the social worker from hospice uh, and the patient's wife was in the house also and the idea of that visit, usually called an intake, uh, an information visit, is to share the positive aspects of how being in hospice can benefit the patient and benefit the family. And then uh, after introducing it that way to see if the patient and family are interested in the hospice benefit and at adding them into their care team. So when we got there, kind of created a semicircle in the house. Myself on one side of the room and her husband the patient on the other side um, and he was very quiet uh, to the extent where he really didn't say anything uh, but just kind of uh, in a disfocused way visually but he was listening very very intently and uh, so the social worker spoke for about 15 or 20 minutes uh, the daughters again having some familiarity familiarity with hospice uh, through their clinical experiences and their jobs uh, were actually uh, pretty jubilant uh, about hospice coming in um, wife wasn't quite sure because she also knew that that meant that her husband is dying um, and the daughter who worked with the cancer group was actually uh, almost celebratory she was really excited and one of those things she couldn't say enough good things about it from the experiences that she had with them but I was watching this man across from me um, and I realized uh, this man was really hurting really really badly um, but he was also kind of a stoic uh, farmer and uh, talking about emotions and feelings wasn't going to happen um, but there was a lot going on in him so I watched him for this 15 or 20 minutes and um, it, it began to realize dawn on me uh, we needed to stop uh, something was really off track and we were missing kind of the point of why we were there which really was him and uh, so I said to the social worker I said uh, I need to kind of stop things for a second um, and that really put a damper in the air. All of a sudden, it, it kind of alarmed everyone else. And uh, so it got real quiet, and I turned to the man and I said, um, I've been sitting here watching us talk to you and your family about hospice, um, but I'm getting a feeling. And I said, I'm gonna tell you what I feel and kind of what I'm sensing you might be thinking, and then I'm gonna go out on a limb because I don't know, but I'm hoping you can kind of guide and tell me if I'm on track or not and he just gives this tiny little nod and I said I'm sitting here and I cannot imagine at all what it would be like to have a bunch of strangers in my house talking to me about my death and talking about it in some kind of animated fashion like the cool parts about it like about hospital beds being brought into my house and medical equipment and drugs being delivered to my house and strangers even if they're chaplains or social workers or nurses a bunch of strangers coming into my house 
about my death. I said, I cannot imagine what it would be like to be sitting here listening to this. And he looked straight at me, and I knew, I could tell by his expression, uh, one, it made him really sad, and two, that I had kind of hit it on the bullseye. That these strangers are in his house with his family, almost not to even talking with him already. We were talking at him. We weren't engaging him, we were talking to his family. And even though he was a quiet, reticent man, we weren't giving him the duty to slow things down for him. And it was a really important moment, and we all just stopped in silence because I really did kind of nail it. And then when those things happen for me, a lot of times I don't know what I'm going to say next. And I looked down, and I said internally, um, I actually have a spiritual guide that I call Wazi, or Z, like the letter Z. And I said, Z, I don't know what to say next. So I put my head down, and I just listened. And this came to me, and it was the first time in almost 30 years of doing healthcare that I actually said this thing. I had thought it a thousand times. I had used it as kind of my private little mantra, my private little saying to help me be compassionate for my patients, but I'd never said it. And I said it. And I said, uh, Bill, I said, I don't have people in my house doing the things that we're doing. And I don't have a terminal diagnosis that's confronting me. I said, but I do know this, is I don't know when my last day on this planet is either. And I said, I could just as easily back out of your driveway with these 15 ton gravel trucks going 70 or 80 mile an hour and think that I just saw dust pass by when actually it's an oncoming another truck. And I could get hit by one of those trucks today and beat you across the line of dying. And I said, I try to think of that every day as a nurse, that even though I'm on this side of the side rails, this side of this kind of imaginary wall that I'm safe because I'm the clinician and I'm the caregiver and I have the stethoscope. Therefore, I'm aiming it at you and you're the one who's looking at dying when actually, truthfully, there's nothing that says it couldn't just be my day ahead of you. And I told him I used to work in head injury ICU, so I used to think this a lot. And it helped me walk into the ICU with a different sense of vulnerability and tenderness because that actually was the truth. The truth is I don't know if this is my last day or not. My patients might outlive me. And the thing that I told Bill, I said, what that does for me is it puts a really high premium on the value of every single day for me because as long as I can be truthful enough to say that to myself and mean it and kind of shake my own cage, then what that does for me is it makes me feel what my patients are feeling. And it's a truth that neither one of us has an answer to. I could, I could die sooner. I could die later. But we all have this day, and none of us know when we get our next car to go and who's next. And I told him, I said, well, the reason I like doing that at one, it's scary. Because it reminds me of my own upcoming spiritual graduation, which is the word I use instead of death, is spiritual graduation. But nobody, I say, said in 30 years I've seen is eager to go. A lot of people want to escape suffering or pain, but I've not yet met anybody from 20 to 90 who's in a hurry to get to the heavens, even if it's the heavens, because we treasure the life that we have and we don't want to leave people in things that we love. So that was a story about Bill, and uh, I still do that to this day. And even though as I sit here in this video now, and I do have a terminal diagnosis, and I am dying, the amazing thing is all of that practice for all of those years of learning to treasure every day of my life. When the diagnosis came, I really realized I'm not going to do anything different. I still live by love. I still live by self-responsibility. And that's how I live my life and have very consciously for the past five years. And so now I kind of get to practice what I've been preaching uh, for decades. And I'm finding that when all is said and done, every second, really is measured by how truthful I am and I'm willing to cry and I'm willing to shake and I'm willing to be afraid so that I can get to the other side and get to the love that comes through there on, on the other side when that invisible glass wall is down and the side rails are down and we're all just people learning about life and learning about love together. Thank you.